Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV Angela Yee, Charlamagne the Guy. We are the Breakfast Club. Now I don't know where Nate Park is broadcasting from, but we on the East Coast, and the weather is disgusting right now. So we, if it's a little glitchy, it's snowstorm central out here. Well, we have the brother Nate Park on the lines. Welcome, brother. What up, brother? What up? What up? You you on the west or the east, Nate? Man, I'm on the west. It'd probably be 75, 80 today. Feel All bad. right, stop bragging. Stop bragging. <laughs> <laughs> We, we, we got Nate here to talk about his new film, man, American Skin. Very, very powerful film. But why the title, American Skin, first of all? Well, brother, you know me, man. Like, my whole thing is about truth, you know? And if we're going we're gonna to talk about being citizens in this country uh, and talk about all the, all the things that come with that, this nation, the Constitution, we have to ask ourselves, where do we fit in, you know? And what does it mean to have American skin? You know, many times I've been in situations where I've seen someone talk about someone that ran past, oh, you know, the guy was American guy, and we know what he means. For us, it's black, right? So right. when it comes to rights, when it comes to equality and equity, we have to really ask ourselves, where do we fit in in this American dream? So for me, it was, what does that mean? I think we have to start asking ourselves these hard questions about where we're going, how we're going to get there, but we got to start at the base level. Like, we're still fighting for our last two fits. Like, what does it mean to have American skin? So I kind of just off top, wanted to give a title that kind of expressed that, that question, that posed the question to us. And again, the film is even, has more questions than it does answers, but I think that's where we have to start. Now the question, you know, with everything going on in the world, did you think about possibly delaying this a little bit because of people not being able to watch it or, you know, people having a hard time? You didn't want that major release kind of like your previous films? No, I mean, I mean, if you think about other cultures and when they speak to speak, speak truth to power around what's happened to them in their communities, how their children are being, if their children are being taken or what are their issues are, I don't think that they wait for opportune times, especially when they're desperate for equity or desperate for justice. You know, we made this film in 2019, bro. Like we, we didn't make this when, when George Floyd came out. You know wow. what I mean? We made this, you know, April, 2019. And it's funny because people say things like, man, this film is so timely, but we black. Like this film was timely. <laughs> 10 right. years ago, this film was timely. And 10 years before that, and 10 years before that, and 10 years before that. And if we're not careful, 10 years from now, I'll be coming on a breakfast club talking about a different movie I made about getting killed by the police or not having equity in education or not or the prison industrial complex. Like these are things that are hitting us in the head every morning we wake up and get out of bed. You know, it's interesting because the way Lincoln Jefferson reacted is how I feel like most humans want to react. I don't want to give away the movie, but, but, but what is it that keeps humans from reacting in that way, you think? Let's keep it real. Most humans do react in that way. We're the ones that don't. Like around every turn, they're throwing, throwing that, this idea of, of peace and locking arms, but no one's really talking about how every other culture has literally fought and died. I mean, we fought as a country for other people who have been killed in the streets that don't live here. We've traveled miles across the pond to fight other people because they're not respecting the human rights of the people in their country. And here we are right here, you know? So I think it's, again, we just gotta be honest, bro, about what it's like to be here. What it's like to wake up and it be a dice roll when we go outside. Like I'm talking to you two brothers and we're not, and we're doing all right. Mm -hmm. But when this interview goes off, if we leave and get in our car and drive anywhere, there's something in the back of our A cop can be on a different street. A cop can be on a freeway on the top going the other way. We can be down on the street and their lights on and we grab the, it's post-traumatic stress in yeah. our own country, you know? But does that ever change? I, I mean, I, I can't, I mean, that's happened to my grandfather, happened to my father, happens to me. You know, I got a, a 17 year old, like it's his license in, in the next 10 days. You know what I mean? It's going to happen to him. You know, it, it's, how, how, how does that change? When does it change? Well, I think, I think we, just like with the film, I think we have to reapproach how we're willing to deal with it and what we're willing to give up, right? It's like, do we want to beat them or do we want to join them? You know, we got to keep it real. Like Audre Lorde has this, this great quote that says, um, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house, right? Mm. And so many of us want to be the in, 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 in assimilated. And I don't mean to say that to disparage anyone, but when you come from nothing, you want something, right? right. But we gotta recognize that we've given something up. I mean, we got more degrees than we've ever had, right? We got, we got 
uh, uh, more people in, holding office that look like us than we ever have. But we also got more people getting killed in the streets. We got more people in prison. So I think we got to ask ourselves, what are we willing to give up so we're not handing this legacy off to our children? You know, like I'm, I'm not okay with the fact that I got, you know, I adopted my nephew. My whole inspiration for this, this, this film, I, adopted, I have five daughters. I adopted my nephew from my sister, right? So it was my only son. And, uh, and I'm thinking, boom, he's going to be in a great school. He's going to have all this opportunity. And, uh, you know, I'm breaking the curse. Next thing you know, Michael Brown is face down, bloating in the street. And my nephew turns to me as we're watching on, on the news. And he says, well, Uncle Nate, what do I do if I get pulled over by the police? Mm -hmm. He's taller than me at 13, 14, dark skin, beautiful young man. And I'm like, damn, I just took him out of the frying pan into the fire because, you know, I'm telling him, OK, grab your phone and, and, and call me and I'll be there. And I'm like, don't grab your phone. Don't grab your phone, nephew. Ooh, right. uh, ooh, put your feet down. Put your hands up. Make eye contact with the cop so he can see your baby face, so he can see that you're not a threat. You know, whatever you do, don't make any sudden moves. Do whatever he says. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm traumatizing my nephew, right? I'm, I'm literally teaching him that everything I've ever stood for doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, you have to literally become less than human or become whatever he is, whatever he sees you. So when you talk about your 17-year-old son, like I, I'm, no, I'm no longer willing to just be like, fuck it, this is the way it's going to be. For, for, for me personally, and, I, and if we're being honest, all of us feel this way. So I, I don't have the answers. The Mill movie doesn't have the answers. But I tell you what, if the next 50 years is like the last 50 years, whereas, you know, at least with Rodney King, the brother got beat, they got arrested. You know what I'm saying? They had to go to court, even though they took it real far so they could get. Nowadays, you know, you did just choke. Eric Garner was like, ah, dead. Nope, we're good. But, but you know what you say, we, we shouldn't have to do that. And my dad is a retired police officer. And the one thing growing up as a kid, my dad always used to say, you got to make it home. You mm -hmm. can't win in the streets with the cops. Right. Once you get home, then we can figure out how to win. But you have to make it home. And like, that was the thing. And that's what I told my kids. Like, even if they wrong, swallow your pride, make it home. Deal with it when you come home. Let, let dad deal with it. You know what I mean? But you got to make it home. But what if you do everything right, Envy? Like, that's right. the thing. So I think that what we have to really ask ourselves, like, all right, what does accountability look like, right? Like, what is police accountability? I mean, I interviewed dozens of cops, looked them in their eyes, and they said to me, you know, hey, I speak, but on the condition of anonymity. I'm like, cool, whatever. Right? I didn't have to interview any cops. I could have just been like, fuck the police. We just going to make sure they look like the trash that they are. I didn't do that. I said, look, if we really want to move forward, we got to find a way to get in their heads too. Right, have conversations that is inclusive of the reality of where we are right now. And then we can still have that conversation about getting home, but everything we do on high level, like we old heads now, like the three of us, we're old heads. Like anything we're doing right now is about, all right, we're gonna make sure from a standpoint of accountability that we're approaching this in a different way. Subjugation leads to revolution, right? Lincoln Jefferson is gonna happen if, if they choose the wrong the wrong person's uh, kid, right? Or the wrong person's relative. The hope is that this is like preventative, me a preventative measure. You know, like they can see this, we can see this, and we can really have the conversation we've been fronting on. Because we always talk about the conversation, right? We have a conversation, you know, not our conversation with our kids, but the conversation around law enforcement. Yeah, but before yeah. we really get to it, it's a barbecue in the hood at Jesse Owens Park, there are a couple cops there, and everybody's smiling, they take pictures, you know? You know, they kill one of our kids, then we got the, uh, the classic image of like the police officer and the black kid hugging each other and they both crying like those are band-aids on bullet holes like we at some point we got to be in my opinion honest about having this type of hard discussion like what you, like you said envy what do we do mm -hmm. well let, let's expound on that do you think the way lincoln jefferson replied is an inevitable response to police brutality it, it is everywhere else subjugation leads to revolution like that's real and that's and i'm not making it up. I'm not saying go out in the streets and do anything. I'm not saying become Lincoln Jefferson. I'm just saying at some point we got to ask ourselves like, where's the line? You know, I don't want to lose my children and I ain't no killer. I just don't want to lose my children. I don't want to lose my uncles. I don't want to lose, you know what I mean? Any, I don't want you to use your, your family. So I think is Lincoln Jefferson among us? Yeah, somebody, yeah. you know, is there a way around it? I really do believe there is but we first need honest conversation. You know what I mean? We have to confront this in a real way if we want to see anything change. And like I said, I, 
I, I'm, I don't know all the answers, man. I'm just an artist. I'm just a filmmaker. I'm just trying to, you know, do what Nina Simone says, reflect the times. That's how, it. How, how have police officers reacted to this film? Very positively, believe it or not. We, we had a chance to screen the film uh, in, in, in upstate New York at the Center for Police Equity uh, for some police trainers. And, you know, it was a scary thing because, you know, I, I don't, I'm not apologetic. Like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go and, and, and stand in front of cops and say, chew the meat, spit out the bones. You know, if anything you don't like, I'm not that dude. I'm like, this is what it is. This is how we feel, you know, so watch it. If you don't like it, cool, I'm out. But the response was, yo, we can use this in for, tra for training, you know? So wow. I think that, I think there is a conversation to be had on, from so many different perspectives, right? That'll deal with the double standards we're, we're dealing with when it comes to police and when it comes to how we're handled. So I think there's a conversation to be had by police, yes. I think there are conversations to be had in our community about, about you know, how we are approaching it, what we're willing to do, being able to close the door. Like, we can't forget, like, what we're doing right now was used to be illegal not too long ago. Like, mm -hmm. we couldn't have a conversation unapologetically talking about what we want to talk about without a white person being present kind of uh, uh, overseeing what we were saying and how. So I think that, you know, there, there are a lot of things that, can, that, that need to be done, but the first step is just being honest about where we're at. And when do you have those conversations? You say you have five daughters and, and, and a nephew that you adopted. You said he's what, 13. So what age do you start having those conversations, you know? I think, I think every kid is different. But I think, you don't want to scare your kids either. You like you don't want them every time they see a you know a police officer or a cop car, they crying. You know what I mean? But you want to tell them so if they ever get into a situation, it's already pre-programmed what to do, what to say to make sure that they you know they're good. Right, but it, but it's really symptomatic of, of 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 other issues. Like like what we're really talking about is white supremacy and, and systemic racism and institutional racism. Like it's no different than me telling my 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 nephew or my daughter at at ten at some point, and I've had those conversations with my girls. Like. You color your skin, someone's gonna maybe call you this. Like you gotta be ready for that. You know what I mean? Like I think that we have to, in, this, in the same way that other communities that have endured genocides talk to their children at very young ages about what they should and should not tolerate, tolerate we should be open to those conversations. Like what's more scary, right? My seven-year-old daughter, me having to talk to her about either police brutality or racism or, and, and tell her about it and her, be scared about it at first, but can it identify it when it's coming from her classmates or her teachers, or to not tell her anything and she come home one day like, wait, like, what does this mean? And why did, why did they say that? And why do I feel this way? So I think that we have to be more open to expose our kids to things that might be hurtful at, in the beginning, but empower them to know how to deal with it. Because most people, even the people that are spewing the ignorance are ignorant themselves. People don't read books no more, they don't read no books. I mean, we saw that from the last, you know, however many years. People just say what they hear and keep saying what they hear. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, when you confront that early, I think you position your kids to be able to, uh, again, honest confrontation, uh, to develop not only an understanding, but a, an offense. Why do, I wonder why, and, you know, I think about this when we watch, um, we watch the police officers slam the young girl. Yeah. to the ground last week unconscious you know uh yesterday police in rochester handcuffed a nine-year-old girl pepper sprayed her yeah. why do you think police officers don't see themselves in others well because they don't see us as them like if we're not seen as human it's it's you not know, it's like it's like the whole idea how you know how people treat their dogs in the united states of america right like mm -hmm. the dog is like a person when you go to other cultures they eat dogs that's what they do you know, if you, if, you, if you see a human like an animal, then you treating it like an animal is not even in the same universe of you seeing yourself in them because you don't see them as human, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, and I think that that is systemic. You know, when I talk to these police officers, you know, one police officer in particular told me, he said, look, Nate, it's like this. He said, when I come to your neighborhood, or can I come in the neighborhood and I see that it's administrative policing. How you doing, sir? How you doing, ma'am? Can I please, thank you very much. Have a nice day. He said, when we go to the jungle, and he said that, and he meant generally jungle speaking, he was like, they hate us. It's, get the fuck out of the car. Get the fuck on the curb right now. He says, it's, it's, it's just the way it is. And I asked him, I was like, wow, that's interesting. Criminal police versus administrative policing. I said, is that in the handbook? He was like, no. I was like, what do you mean? He was like, well, you, everyone just knows. I was, wow. I was like, what do you mean, everyone? He said, it's just the way, it's just the way it is. But again, 
when there's no uh, accountability, because look, I don't really, if a cop don't like me, that's okay. In fact, if a cop is racist, fine. But when that can, we can use that, the bias or whatever he's feeling to pull up a gun out and kill me or kill my, or shoot someone I'm, I'm with, that's when that power becomes so desperately corrupted. And if there's no accountability, that's what keeps the cycle going. I don't care how you feel about me. I want laws in place, accountability in place, where whatever you're feeling is what you're feeling, but you don't have the right to take my life or, or to just dehumanize me on the strength. Yeah, whatever that book it is that officers keep talking about, because I keep hearing them say this, well, they did it by the book, they did it by the book. Yeah. That book is making them sociopaths. Yeah. <laughs> do you think Do you think cops put on the uniform and just automatically become sociopaths? N not necessarily. I mean, look, this is just like, again, I don't have all the answers. I think this. The second you say, I want to be a part of a system that brutalizes, subjugates, marginalizes, and controls and intimidates people, regardless of what color you are, the second you step into that paradigm and you're breathing that air that is pervasive, whether you like it or not, you're gonna become a part of that. You, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's absolute power, it corrupts absolutely, right? Like I, I'm not making that up. So I think that there are well-intentioned men and women that have gone into law enforcement saying, look, this is how it's gonna be. I'm gonna fix things. I'm gonna be the person that fix things. I'm gonna make sure. And I do believe there are people that have told that line and been able to make it through. But the majority of people that become engaged in these type of systems that just by virtue of their existence are corrupt when it comes to how they dehumanize or treat people, it's unavoidable. Some of the worst videos I saw in my, my research our, our brothers and, and, and Latino brothers with the baton hitting people, breaking legs, trying to prove that they're brothers with the, you know, I, I, I think it's systemic. And I think that's another thing we got to think about. Like, yo, look, if a, if a cop kills someone, right, we want justice. All right, cool. That cop is fired. I don't know if we should just be happy. And that's it. Like, boom, he's out of there. Because if, if the company is creating widgets and the widgets are killing black people, destroying the widgets doesn't stop the company from creating the widgets, right? Mm -hmm. We gotta find a way to say, okay, obviously there's something wrong with this institution. And we can't be okay with the fact that it just hasn't happened to us yet. Cause like you said, if you got a son, we can't just hope and hold our breath and roll dice every time they get up and say, yo, I'm going to see my girlfriend, I'm going to see my, my boys, I'm going here. But that's what we do. Right. We literally, my nephew, so he was 13, um, 2013, 2014, Michael Brown died. Right now, he just got into USC uh, for, for uh, this master's. Like the only wow. man in our family to ever get a master's, wow. you know, he passed me. But he could, even now, what time is it here in, in LA? If, if I got a phone call, you know, I, it, it scares me to think that any moment this six foot two dark skin achiever could try could, could be so bold as to exercise his rights and then be gone from the face of the earth because i'm not right. there to de-escalate him, him right you know uh lincoln jefferson i love i love that name i know it's some science in that name yeah. but what, what's why did why that name lincoln jefferson well there are a number there are a number of names you know I mean, a number of reasons why uh one is a, is a call to our our desperation to kind of uh to, to fit in in society and to and to try to accept and walk in this American dream, right? I've met so many people, black folks, who are proudly named after people who weren't necessarily for us. You know what I mean? It's like, here's, this is a man that's not only a, a veteran who has served his time, who has come home and things haven't been right, because there are a lot of veterans and a lot of us has a history. A lot of my uncles and aunts, army, military come back and they struggling like they never left. You know, we talk about Lincoln in the same way we talk about King, right? Because there's, there's two Lincolns, right? There's Lincoln freed the slave, and there's I have a dream king, right? But we ignore the Lincoln, who in the Lincoln Douglas debates was like, nah, I don't think black people are equal. Mm -hmm. And why do I have to feel bad about pointing out history? Mm -hmm. I've literally had people say, you can't say that. Why? But I'm not. I'm just say, reading the paper. You ain't making it up. I'm right. not making this up. And Jefferson, come on. Thomas Jefferson? Anyone that's read anything about him, his, his relationship, with with his uh property and his and his property and his relationship with the descendants of his his property 
And, and, and the fact that when he died, he was like, nah, keep them locked up. Like we have, I just think we have to be honest about these things and talk about e even the, the ways in which we are reaching at straws to be a part of this country, you know? So I wanted to give a name that was a, was, was a call back to our desperation as a people to be seen as, as Americans to our own detriment. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a lot of times, you know, we, we've seen folks rebel against, a lot of the times we've seen folks rebel against officers in America, it's been military veterans. I'm thinking about, um, uh, what's the brother, Chris, uh, Donna. Chris, what's his name? Donna, Chris Donna. Chris, Chris Donna. Donna. W w why do you think that is? Well, I think, again, I think subjugation leads to revolution. I think you marginalize a person long enough, especially when a person has sacrificed in a way where they, where they, where they have integrity, Mm. and they know they're right because that's the thing about this country sometimes it's like no matter how right you are you're still wrong right like even like what we just talked about and like no matter how right we are mm -hmm. we still got to tell our kids to shut up right and, and that they don't have rights and that they better put their hands on the steering wheel like this you know so i think that at some point people hit a breaking point we talk a lot about a lot you've heard how many conversations we heard about we got to talk about mental illness in the black community true Absolutely. but don't we got to talk about how a lot of those people have those psychic breaks and how that and where that untreated trauma comes from. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like we know people in, 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 in the streets that we be like, man, he's off. Oh man, don't, don't, don't cross him. Again, right. symptoms, symptomatic. We, we talk about the symptoms, but we don't talk about the sickness. When you break a person's mind over and over and over, which is plantation, the plantation, right? At some point, they will become what we are encouraging them to be. You know, whether it be an animal, whether it be a monster, whether it be a killer, whether it be a, 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 a you know, a hustler, whether it be a pimp, we don't talk about the, the sickness. We only talk about, you know, the symptom. Right. Now, do you care about ratings? Like, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, the ratings of the movies, and sometimes I feel like the people that rated don't get it because they don't look like you, per se. Do you, does that bother you ever? That just brings me back to when, when Jay-Z used to say, yo, I can't worry about what Rolling Stone says about my my music because they not from me. They're not from my environment. They don't understand the things that I say. I'll say this. All I want, bro, is for our people to be free. That's all I want, you know? Like, if I'm blessed enough to live to 100 years old, you know, I'm on my deathbed and I'm surrounded by people I love, generations, you know, my children, my children's children, my children's children's children. And they're looking at me like, yo, like what did he do for us? If they have an answer, if I got my receipts in order, that's all that matters to me. I, I, when I say brothers, I don't care. I don't care. I don't, and, and when I say I don't care, I don't care about the now. I don't care about what happens to me. You know, I, I, everyone's entitled to their opinion. This is art. You know what I'm saying? You, you see, you know, not everyone likes Baldwin. I love Baldwin. Some people might go, ah, some of his, you know, the Panther and the Lash, all oh, those poems. Who knows? I don't know. Everyone's entitled to their own, position, own opinion. I just want my receipts. You know, when, I, when I'm on my deathbed, I want them to be like, okay, great, great, great granddad. He recognized that we needed something, right? He didn't give us all the answers, but he, he gave us a path as to understanding what we should and should not tolerate in America, what we should, should not tolerate for our people. I just want us to be free, man. Like, and I'm gonna keep making art that I believe will demonstrate a path toward that. And again, I'm just a dude, I'm just an artist. You, you, both of you and Angela, y'all do more important work every single day. Journalists disseminating information to the people. We tune in to what's going on in the world so we don't have to deal with sometimes mainstream media. Media, we can get the truth from y'all about us because you represent us. I'm just an artist. I throw stuff up and I keep it moving. That's it. You know, and, 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 and truth be told, you know, we have, you know, we have the highest audience, uh, uh, audience response rating on Rotten Tomatoes of any feature film. You go to Amazon, Amazon, our people, we got over 2,500 reviews, all five stars. That means the people are watching it. This is a grassroots thing. I want the people, I want people to watch this with their children, turn it off and turn to their children and say, listen, mm -hmm. now we're gonna talk about this. And I want those kids 15 years from now to be like, yo, I can remember where I was when I watched that film my pop turned to me with tears in his eyes and said, listen, son, or listen, daughter, or whoever, this is what this movie's trying to say. This is why it's important to you. And hopefully, 
10 years from now, as they're, they're remembering and recalling it, we're in a different place. It's nostalgia, but for the right reasons, because we've literally broken through and had breakthroughs as a people. Yeah, I know how this film is, uh, how this film probably will resonate with black people. How do you want it to resonate with, with white folks and, and others who don't, who don't live our existence? If you even care. Yeah, well, that's the thing, right? Like, I think, as I said before, first, I think our voices have to be elevated um, because I think that there is the way the country is designed, you know, with respect to who has power. A lot of times our voice don't get to the masses. It's like, you know, there's, I'm not to give away the film, but there is a, a, a line where the guy basically says, the world needs to see what's happening. You know what I mean? So by us understanding our condition, or by us elevating our voices, if nothing else, if only the continent, if only it resonates only. They say, all right, Nate, the only people that's gonna resonate with people that look like you in the United States of America and people that look like you on the continent and UK, you know, whatever, like black people, African people, people African descent all over. If that was it and they drew a line and I couldn't do anything about it, I would be, I would be like, okay, like if I gotta accept that, fine. The reality is, is we have media, we have digital, we have Zoom, we have, so when, when, when the white friends call us and George Floyd, oh my God, what can I do to help? You know what you can do? Well, watch this film and talk to your kids about racism and white supremacy and privilege. And you know what? Don't be afraid to draw the parallels between the double standard and policing that we see in this film and what we see, saw at the Capitol. I think if, 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 if the best thing that people are not in our community can do is confront racism and white supremacy the same way that we're having to front, confront racism and white supremacy. And guess what? Even if you don't, you don't have to go out and, 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 and find a random black person at a, uh, at, a, at a Starbucks and say, oh my, you know, uh, can I have a hug? Like that shit, <laughs> don't, that don't, you know what I'm saying? Like that shit don't help. It's like really, you gotta address your internalized white supremacy. You gotta address it. You gotta speak out about institutional racism or racism you see in your kids' private school and the barriers to entry when it comes to us trying to get a proper education for our kids. You gotta speak out about the double standards when it comes to sentencing and bail reform. Like if, if it can't be no turkey on Thanksgiving charity. I do think white people need to see the film. I do, I do think cops are gonna see this. I don't think they're gonna tell people, but I think they're gonna be some cops that push that, push that play button on Amazon Prime because they hear about it or on, on, on iTunes and watch it. And I think at the end of it, whatever they feel, they'll know that there was truth in it. And they'll know that there was a desire to gain understanding unapologetically. Listen, I wanna go back to the military thing real quick. Like, cause you know, Lincoln Jefferson is a military vet. What are your thoughts on black people joining the military to fight for a country that doesn't fight for us? It's, it's an interesting question. It comes up a lot. You know, I only speak personally to, to, what, I, to what I think. I will never, you know, first of all, I'll never disparage anyone that looks like me publicly for any reason. I just won't. You know what I mean? Like that, that goes back to the plantation. Like, again, those are those are the, 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 the device of techniques that I'll never align with. I think they have to, some conversations I'd be having private. Anything that I feel from a negative standpoint about, you know, what black people should or should not do, I think it's for, it's for different company. But I will say this. This is as much our country, if not more, than any other people walking around, not just because we fought, but because we're responsible for the freedom in this country, right? Like we fought in every single war, specifically if you look at like Red Tails, like if it wasn't for the Tuskegee Airmen, mm -hmm. I don't know if we win. Because mm -hmm. we went from losing some crazy number like 80% of all bombers to losing zero in combat. You know what I mean? It's the, I don't think our contribution is a small one. It's not a participation award. We were MVP in all the wars. You know what I'm saying? Civil War, MVPs. Mm -hmm. Lincoln knew what time it was. Frederick Douglass, when he went to him and said, yo, you got to let us fight, it's because we were losing. <laughs> That's real. You know what I'm saying? So I think that I honor all the people that look like me have, that have fought for this country. But I'll say they fought for their country. We built the country. We continue to build it. We build it with brick and mortar. We build it with culture. Appropriated or not, it's still ours. We still build it. This radio show is more important than any other, in my opinion, mainstream media outlet that exists. And I'm not saying that to, to, to be negative or 
create controversy. God knows I'm not trying to do that. I'm saying it to say when it comes to my experience, when it comes to asking questions like, how do we feel about our veterans that look like us, that go that as we speak on other is on, on other soil, as they're hearing about, you know, brothers and sisters Brianna Taylor, and they're hearing, hearing about all the all the killings, and still got to wake up, look at that watch, clean that weapon, and go out and, and, and march and look for someone to to to, to make sure that they're, they're doing what they're supposed to do. I think that this country is ours. I think we've earned it. We've earned every step we take. Every every uh, I still, because, you know, as Baldwin says, we have the right to hold this country accountable in every way, shape, and form. You know, it's funny. I was, you know, talking to my dad. And, of course, he was in the military. And I asked him why. Well, you know, why? And his whole thing was there was no jobs. He was like, I couldn't get a job. I had the main, I had two sisters. My father wasn't in my life. I had to support my mother. So I had to do it. And he said, but joining the military wasn't a problem. He said, when I came back home. He yep. said, I figured I'd be, you know, a military vet. You know, I just you know, did my four years in military. I get a job. He said, I couldn't find a job. He said, I went from military to fixing cars at a, at a, at a car lot. And yep. he said, there was nobody that would give me a job. He said, so the only job that I had, he said, I took, he said, I did what all black people did back then. I took the sanitation test. I took the post office test and the police officer test. He said, the police officer test was the one that came back the first. He says, and I needed a job. And I just feel like we don't take care of our vets in this country. Like our vets come home, you see them on the side of the road, 25 cent for food. You know, they don't have a place to stay. They don't have no, it's, it's, it's horrible the way we treat our own. That's right. That's right. You, can't tell me, you're like, you can't tell me anything about being a patriot based off the way we treat our veterans. At all, at all. And guess what? We're allowed to say that. The problem is we're not having those conversations publicly and holding people accountable to those conversations and answers. Because again, I've never, I mean, we're talking about a country where World War II, they come back from winning the war and they tell them on the ship before they got to the dock, take off your stripes. And they would have mobs looking, as they came off the boat, mobs waiting to lynch them in their uniforms. That's crazy. Like real talk, like we saw, like, what we're seeing right now, and that's, and that's the thing, when people are like, ah, our history is like, yo, every other culture that has experienced a history that has been tumultuous, that has included genocide, they will throw it in your face every time so you never, ever, ever forget. I mean, 2021, 100 years removed from the Tulsa massacre, right? Like, why is no one talking about that? Everyone's like, when you, when you see what happened on January 6th and understand Tulsa, how they literally came into a community, pulled people out of their houses, killed those people, you know, took the remaining people, put it on the fairgrounds, looted those people's homes, and burned all those houses to the ground. Like that happened in America 100 years ago. We've seen it play out over and over and over and over again. So again, like to go full circle, when we ask like, what, what are we going to do about it? Like there's historical context, you know? Like we got to look at the fact that, yo, this stuff is not new. But if we don't do something, the next 50 years is going to be crazy. With technology, crazy. I do. I will say this. I believe a lot of our hope is in the young people. You know what I mean? I'm 41 years now. I'm not as young as I used to be. But I feel like we have to really hold up young people that understand platforms, understand their platforms, encourage them with what we know so they can, you know, you know, they can use what they know, uh, you know, with respect to. I mean, imagine if Harry had Facebook. Yeah. You know I mean? Or Nat had Twitter. Yeah. You know, they got tools that we never had. And so uh, I think there has to be less disparaging of our young people and, uh, and more encouragement when it comes to, to them literally stepping up and saying, all right, enough is enough. You know, we might, I think in this generation, we might see the next Tupac, for real. You know, Speaking I don't about know. enough is enough, I guess, I guess this is my final question. Do you, do you think police brutality would still be as much of an, much of an issue as it is if, if people responded to the injustice the way Lincoln Jefferson did? In American skin? No. <laughs> there you go. This is the answer. Right. <laughs> you got to watch American skin. Then. <laughs> right. Check it out, American I, skin. I think I, I. I mean, I, I'm. I'm with you. To be totally honest, because I don't. I don't have any answers. Yeah. And as you said, after after a while, it, 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 subjugation becomes revolution. It, it's only a matter of time. Yeah. And guess what, bro? It's okay. Like they, the status quo, or I'll say they, right? Make us feel bad for what's happening to us and make us feel bad for being frustrated 
and being out of options and even entertaining the idea that anything's an option. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's wrong. That's like gaslighting. Like, we, we got to be, we, we need to be able to have all kinds of conversation about protecting our children. Because the children are not fine in this country. Ours aren't. You know what I mean? Keeping them alive is one thing. But even think about it like this. Our brother, if our brother Michael Brown lives, then they lock him up yeah. for the same thing. If the cop would have shot him, he wouldn't have died. They'd have threw the book at him. You know, so it's not, so there's police killing, but then there's just walking and breathing. That's right. We're being miseducated, like, in, 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 in the ways that it's criminal. Like, if you can't afford a, a proper education, you're doomed. Everyone knows that. Absolutely. And so what do we do? We're not going to play Russian roulette with our kids. So all of our kids, on you know, Envy, I'm sure your kids got the best education. My kids are getting the best education. So you're in a situation where you're like, I'm not going to put them in the worst schools to prove a point. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think that, again, I don't have all the answers. Uh, I wish I had more, but, you know, all of us are, are, are trying to figure this thing out. This film is just a, a critique, which has more questions than answers. You know what I mean? I'm no, you know, no hero. I'm no, I'm just an artist, man. Just trying to reflect the times in a way that makes us have conversations like this. So our, our listeners, our audience can approach this thing a little differently. Absolutely. Well, thank, thank you, brother, you, for Nate. checking him in. I know it was early out there, man. It's all good. For y'all, anything. American Skin is a must-watch, man. I, I, I'm not gonna lie. I, um, I, I watched uh, uh, G, what is it, Judas and the Black Messiah, and then American Skin. It's not a good combination. Two great movies, mm -hmm. <laughs> but you will be triggered as a black person mm -hmm. in America in a good way, though. You're gonna be triggered to want to do something. Right. That's it. Do something. And, and like I said, watch American Skin. Watch it with family, suggest it to your white friends. If you have a cop, suggest it to your cop. Envy, show your pops, because I'd be definitely. very curious to know what he thinks about it. Solutions will come out Absolutely. of that. You know? Okay. Well, thank you, brother. We appreciate you again. Thank, thank you, King. Dave Parker. Anytime. Breakfast Club. Good morning. Thank you, brother. Peace. Much love. Peace.